Chapter 12. Nice. Chapter 12, Residential Mortgages. My favorite. The only thing I want to say as an introduction to this chapter is know as much as you can about mortgages because if you do, you'll be better than 90% of real estate agents out there, right? Mm -hmm. Real estate agents know absolutely nothing about mortgage. I got a call from a lady one time when I worked in the mortgage team. And she says, I've been in the business 25 years. I said, you've been in the business 25 years and don't know the first thing about mortgage. I said, so don't call me on this anymore. I'll call you when it's ready to close. Sometimes you have to put your foot down. And that, that's really the main thing about mortgage is you have to understand that the closing disclosure has to be acknowledged three days prior to closing. You have to know these things. When a lender tells you they need a two-day extension and they haven't sent the CD out, there's a problem. You need to understand that so that you're not asking for multiple extensions and dealing more paperwork and getting losing confidence with your customer and the other agent. So these things are important. That's why it's important to know a lot about real estate mortgages, right? Mm -hmm. So we're just going to get through it real quick. So first of all, what is a mortgage? Everybody says, well, i got to pay my mortgage. No, you have to pay your note. You have to pay your promissory you pay your note. note. Your mortgage. The mortgage is the instrument that pledges your property as security. It's the collateral for your debt, mm -hmm. right? The mortgage says, if you pay, you stay. You don't, you won't. That's what the mortgage says, right? This whole process of doing a mortgage is called hypothecation. Hypothecation is the pledging of property security without surrendering possession. So I'm pledging this property, but I'm living in the house. Mm -hmm. I still have my deep sea, right? Oh, that's how he's calling Colombia, yeah. Okay, hypothecation. Hypotheca. Right? So. This has to be in writing to be enforceable. Somebody can't just foreclose on your property if you haven't signed a mortgage instrument. And then you don't pay. Yeah, we call it mortgage. And then you don't pay. You're, right. you're, you now have adverse possession. Yeah. We talked a little bit about adverse yeah. possession. And, and then it's recorded, right? When we record a document, that's called constructive notice. Remember we talked about actual notice, constructive mm -hmm. notice. Actual notice is doing it. Constructive notice is paying mm -hmm. or like recording it. Right? And then there's different types of liens. So it's going to create a lien on the property. There's, a, there's two different types of liens, and we're going to talk about later. There's lien theory and there's title theory, right? Lien theory is, I put a lien on your property, you retain, we retain the title till you pay it off, then we give you the title, right? Title theory is you give the title, you get the title, and then we have to backtrack and put a lien that way. It's, it's, it's the opposite. Right? Depends on who holds it. Florida's a lien theory state. Um, mortgages, so we have two parties, right? You have mortgage or person taking out the mortgage, you have mortgagee, the person giving the mortgage, whoever's mm -hmm. giving it, right? Really easy to remember, the borrower, borrower has two O's in it. Borrower is a mortgager. Borrower has two O's, mortgager has two O's. Mortgagee. Mortgagee has two E's, lender has two E's. Mortgagee has two E's, right? Mortgagee two O's. Right? So mortgagor, mortgager owns the property. I own the property, I'm pledging the security with a mortgage instrument through the process of hypothecation, right? That's what the mortgager is doing. The lender owns the mortgage. The lender owns that note that you're pledging the collateral. They, does that make sense? There's your two O's and two E's, right? Borrowers to mortgagor, lenders to mortgagee. It's the easiest way to remember. When you call for insurance, they're gonna say, I need the mortgagee clause, right? Work for Bank of America, ISAOA, ATIMA, right? ISAOA is its successors or and assign and or assigns as their interest may appear. That's what ATM means. So we say Bank of America, ISAOA, ATIMA, right? Those things are, um, and they always say Bank of America, NA. NA does not mean North America, it means National Association. <laughs> People think it means North America. People really ask that? They used to ask that all the time when I worked there. Right? So we have these other things called loan instruments, right? So we have this thing called a promissory note. Well, that's the promissory note. That's the actual thing you have to pay. That's what you're paying off. You're paying your note. You're paying your mortgage. Uh, on your dollar bills, it says, it says this is legal tender or dollar. That's a promissory note that you get the dollar for this piece of paper I'm giving you. That's what... That's what it is. It's a note saying that I promise to pay. It's a note. It's a legal paid. tender. This note is legal tender. That's a yeah. note. The actual dollar bill is a note. Legal instrument that serves evidence of debt, right? It's prima facie evidence that it's your that you have this debt, right? 
promise to repay that debt makes the borrower personally liable for that debt. And if the mortgage is foreclosed upon doesn't satisfy that debt, the lender can actually sue you for the difference. They can get a deficiency judgment, is what it's called. Now, that all depends on how it's written in Congress, because back when Obama was president, we didn't have that, right? Because he had did this debt forgiveness, this unpaid debt forgiveness because of the mortgage crisis. But just know that the mortgage can, the, the, the lender, the mortgagee, can go after you for the deficiency judgment. Here's your note, provides the final financial details, right? The note shows how much the payment is how much the total amount borrowed is, how you need to repay it, when it's late, right? 15 day, after 15 days, it's late. How much is the late fee? 5% interest rate and borrower's failure to pay. <laughs> but it talks about everything. You have to pay in a certain time period, how much your payment is, how much you borrowed, what your interest rate is, when well, you have to pay it back. Bank. Could be. Okay. That's the promise. So the promissory is. note includes the amount of debt. You don't have to know. You have to know what's there, but if you really think about it, this is your this is your payment method. Right. Promissory is like a promise. You know? It's your promise to pay. Yeah. Yeah. Just remember, That's it. promissory note is my promise to pay. Yeah. Like I'm making a promise, right? Mortgage lien priority priority is normally determined by the order liens are recorded. Remember we talked about that, mm -hmm. right? We have superior liens mm -hmm. and junior liens. Right. First mortgage is always going to be recorded first. That's why they call it a first mortgage. The second mortgage would be like a HELOC equity line of credit. Right. Uh, subordination. Uh, we used to do these things called piggybacks. We used to do uh, 80 20 loans, we do 20% mm -hmm. on the second. The bank used to do that for right. employees. If the owner executes another mortgage without paying off the first mortgage, that mortgage goes in the second position. It has to be subordinated. Mm -hmm. It has to be subordinated. So if you refi the first and you subordinate it to go back on the second, right? The date and time of day establishes priority over subsequent liens. Remember, it establishes over subsequent liens, but we just learned that mortgages are junior liens to things like property taxes, mm -hmm. right? So property taxes get paid first. And the rest. Special assessments get paid first. Mm -hmm. Then your mortgages get paid. Right. Right. Taxes paid first. Right. First. IRS liens are the bottom. behind mortgages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're the last. We just talked about subordination. We know what a subordination is. We talked about it before, right? Right. So I get, I have a first mortgage for four hundred thousand. I have a second mortgage for one hundred thousand because I did an eighty twenty loan. I pay off the four hundred thousand because I want a lower interest rate. To refi that. Or by refining it, that second mortgage moves up to first mortgage. Why? Because date and time is afterwards. So in order to to put that other one back into first mortgage, you do this thing called a subordination agreement. Confusing, right? Subordination agreement, the other lender has to agree to it. We agree to go back into second position. Most of the time they will, but every once in a while they'll say no. We did them. But if you have an equity line that has a $60,000 limit and you've got to charge up to $48,000 and you've had six late payments in the last two years, I'm probably not going to let you go to to first lien or second lien position, I'm probably not going to subordinate because I'm scared I'm going to get my money back. There's a, a limit to what a second lien can actually collect on legally. So you want to make sure that you're in first position. So in that case, I wouldn't allow subordination to happen. Right? When there's more than one lien on property, priority goes again the order it was paid, right? If the property is sold, right? So these superior liens get paid first, junior lien second, and then once the junior liens are in priority of date, right? Construction liens being the exception, right? Because it's based on the point of beginning, not on what they call it point of commencement, right? Right. When they not the war, on the not when they done, finished. right? Higher priority liens can be subordinated to subsequent liens if the other party agrees on it. Subordination agreements are used to do this, right? To take a lower lien priority. So I'm subordinate. I'm going below you. Does that make sense? Yeah. What happens if you pay off your mortgage? You get the satisfaction. Mm -hmm. They record an instrument saying you paid off in full this mortgage. Mm -hmm. Releases a contract of that mortgage instrument because remember the mortgage instrument is your contract, right? Mm -hmm. I'm pledging the collateral for this loan. Mortgage must mortgage must cancel the mortgage and re record the satisfaction within sixty days. 
You're not going to have to know that part of the test. Just know that satisfaction is going to release your liability. Mm -hmm. Recording satisfaction shows that the mortgage lien has been removed. So it removes the lien from the property. Mm. So when you get a title search, it's kind of all these conditions on it. One of them is going to say, pay off the Bank of America for $180,000. That's what, that's what this that lien is. House. That's what this lien that's is, right? Gold. Satisfaction that's of the mortgage is what I'm going to receive eventually. I didn't have a satisfaction of mortgage. I just had a deed. So I paid cash. <laughs> Nice. You know, it's that it's that a mortgage if you pay cash for your house. So right? you gotta have a mortgage to get a satisfaction. Correct, because <laughs> you don't satisfy the mortgage if you can't pay. <laughs> now I have a mortgage on my new house, so, you so now I'll get a satisfaction house. eventually. Mm -hmm. You know, five years or so down the road when I pay the house off, right? Um, but with interest rates being low, it's smart to have. I got mine at two and a quarter, so I might leave it there forever. I don't know. Eh, you know, That's it'd be I'm nice not, to pay. I'm off. at four point nine nine, so it's not that great, but it's okay. Yeah. So then we have this mortgage law, right? We talked about lien theory. So Florida is a lien theory state. Borrower retains legal title to the property, but there's a lien on the property. That's what this mortgage comes into play, right? Title theory is different. Title goes to when you have a car is a good example, right? You get a lien, you, you, you're buying a car, right? I got a loan from SunTrust across the street, right? For my right. car. The title goes to... The DMV. No, it goes to... Title doesn't go to DMV. Electronic title, that's different. That's different. Title goes to the bank. Oh, when you pay off the mortgage, that's true. when you pay off the mortgage, or you pay off the loan, it's an installment loan, then the mortgage, I keep saying mortgage, the then the lien gets released. Mm -hmm. But there's no lien on a car. It's title theory. The title goes to the bank. You, you pay it off, they mail, you, they mail you the title, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah, right. we had an electronic title. We title. retain this thing called equitable title, right? I still can use it, right? I just don't own it. I can't do anything with it, right? Now I could sell it, and the title gets paid. It gets paid off, but you never get the transfers, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or Georgia is a title theory state, right? This means that they can take your house and not go through the foreclosure process because there's no mortgage, right? Here, there's a note, but there's no mortgage, right? Here, there's a mortgage. So here, we have to go through the foreclosure process, right? So it's actually quicker for them to kick you out in a state like this. In Georgia. Just for example. Hmm. So we have these borrower's covenants and agreements. This is all the paperwork that goes on, right? Promises to repay, your taxes and liens, talks about property insurance, occupancy, and maintenance to for a covenant to be repair, right? That means you can't, you ever heard of, you see a condemned property. Condemned property, condemned property is something that is not kept in good condition, right? You let the grass grow up, you have municipal liens on it, you have broken windows, you don't do anything. So part of the agreement in a mortgage is to keep the property in good shape, right? Occupancy means if I haven't bought an investment property and I bought another occupier, I need to occupy it within 60 days of closing. That's what they consider occupying it in a timely manner. So if you have a VA loan or an FHA loan or an owner occupied primary residence, you gotta be there within 60 days. That means physically move in there, turn on the utilities and do all the other stuff. Property insurance says, I'm gonna keep insurance while my loan is under a mortgage, right? I have a note on it. Just like when you have a car, you have to have a higher car insurance coverage. You can't just have PIP if you have a, a note on it, right? Taxes and liens, I have to pay my taxes and I don't want to get any additional liens on it, right? But if I do that, why do you think they require you to have an escrow account if you're under 8% or over 80%? Because they want to make sure your taxes are paid. The bank's making sure that they're securing their collateral. And you sign this promise to repay. That's what these things mean. What about the occupancy part? Uh, occupancy, you have to live there within 60 days on a primary residence. That's only for primary. Right? Yeah, if, it, if it's a secondary or secondary residence, then you don't have to because it's a second home, mm -hmm. right? And if it's a investment property, then somebody else is going to occupy yeah, got it. it. Right? It could be vacant. It doesn't matter. But you've got to get the right type of loan. If you have an investment loan, it's not going to require that 60-day occupancy. Got it. You want to occupy two out of five years for tax purposes. Right. So you want to have a primary every two every Two, two out of the five years, two out of the last five years so you want for five. tax purposes, for cap gains. And we'll talk about capital gains later. Right. So then each mortgage has a different set of rules. 
there's a few different ones. And, and we're going to talk about, um, I haven't seen a lot of commercials lately, but we're going to talk about RP funding, right? So everything has a purpose. There's not necessarily a good or bad to anything. I'll pay all your closing costs if you use us. That's, that's, that's his motto. He does this stuff, right? Why? Because there's a prepayment clause in that mortgage. Prepayment clause says if you don't keep the mortgage for three years and you pay it off early by refinance or by paying it off, you're going to have to pay us some type of penalty. A penalty might be three or five percent of the loan, right? And I don't know what it is. And it may or may not even be there. But that's how these companies do this. They actually say, well, I'll pay all your closing costs if you do this. Well, read the fine print because if there's a prepayment right. clause, they'll get, they'll get you on the back end if you pay your house off early, right? So here's the penalty, right? There's a clause here that says allows you to pay all or without penalty. Then there's this prepayment penalty clause, right? Which is what I was just describing. Mm -hmm. That's where they get you. And it's not just that company, it could be any company that has this, well, we'll give you a reduced interest rate, but that reduced interest rate like, costs money. Yeah, like, those, so, so, or like those bonds, you know, when you get your house, the first right. home time buyer. Yeah, they have a right. right. When you have a bond, you have five, five years. Five years. Right. Five years. Five years. You got to pay something back, right? That's a little different. It's right. not It's not the prepayment clause. That's a different, that's a debt forgiveness clause. But, but these prepayment clauses are more common than you think. Especially if you get a reduced rate, but something like that. Can, Correct. Yeah. Acceleration clause means you haven't done what you're supposed to do. We're going to make you pay off the whole balance. I've only seen it once in my whole career. That's how it was. Um, a guy bought a house for his ex-wife. He immediately took himself off the deal after he closed the mortgage. We did a post-closing audit. We saw that. I had to call the guy up and said, put yourself back on title or we're going to call what I'm doing. How did he, take, did he do a deed? He changed the deed, yeah. What? Because he was trying to buy a house for his ex, but he didn't want to be on the note anymore. Or on the mortgage. Mm -hmm. Or on the deed. He was buying it for his ex-wife. He was trying to get himself off the deed. But he was on the note and the mortgage. But if it has a mortgage, you can't just sign a deed like You that can't. Time. So I called him up and said, if you do that, or if you don't put yourself back on it, we're going to call this loan due in full in 30 days. Wow. So that's why you have to repay it. Got it. It's not very nice to call how did the bank get notified on that? I we did on a post closing audit. We saw it. So it was a post closing. His name was Tom audit. Smith. I remember it. It was Texas Tom property. Smith. It was Texas property. Yep. Thank you. I was the guy I had to call, so I know. I was like, "Hey, we're going to pull this acceleration." I said, "I'm sorry." I was like, "You're a nice guy. I understand what you're doing, but to protect the bank's interest, we have to do it this way." If he removes himself from title, and he's the only one on the note in the mortgage, they can't foreclose on that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That person owns the house. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, the person who owns the house didn't sign the mortgage. Well, if the person who owns the house didn't sign the mortgage, then they can't foreclose because the mortgage is against that person. It's against collateral, but if that person didn't sign it, you could win in court. Right. So it's a it's a it's a catch point too. That's why that person has to stay on title. Right? They have the right to reinstate. So if, you, if you've initiated this foreclosure, if you've initiated this acceleration clause, you can cure the property. You can pay up what's due in full, whatever else, and have this right of redemption. This, so this, this whole right to reinstate is also called right of redemption. That's right? It. If you can go all the way to foreclosure, auctioning on the courthouse steps, theoretically, mm -hmm. and you can walk in that courtroom, pay that fine, or go to the clerk of court, pay everything up in full, and you can redeem your property. You can get it back all the way up to foreclosure, all the way up until it's actually closed. Yeah, actually, all the way up until it's closed, you okay. can do this. It's called a right of redemption. Right of redemption. Okay. Do you want a sale clause? If you sell a house, it prevents your refinance, right? Because you can't refinance it after mm -hmm. you've sold it. And then there's this defeasance clause. So in a lien theory state like us, right? When the property is no longer pledged by collateral, we've recorded this satisfaction of mortgage. That's called defeasance. The mortgage is now defeated, right? We now have won. We, we paid it off. We've now won. There's a defeasance clause. If it's a title theory state, when the debt's paid off, the mortgagor, the borrower, receives the title. We get the title from the bank. Right? Lien theory, we get the title right now. Mortgage theory, the bank gets the title, and they give it to us when we pay it off. Make sense? So the foreclosure process is different. So we have mortgage features, we have a down payment. Everybody knows what a down payment is, right? We put money down to buy a house, right? 
We have this loan to value ratio. It's the value of the house versus how much the loan is. So if the value of the house is 500,000 and the, and the, uh, the mortgage is for 400,000, the loan is 80% of what the house is worth, right? Value. It's called loan to value, right? Relationship of the amount borrowed to purchase price, right? Equity is whatever your extra is. So in that scenario I just said, your equity was $100,000. Current market value minus your mortgage debt equals your equity, right? So if the house is worth a million dollars, your loan is for five hundred thousand. You have five hundred thousand equity. Interest. Well, everybody knows what interest is, right? You borrow money, you pay this extra money back, right? That's interest. Loan servicing. Those are the people that collect your payments, make sure your escrows are right. You do all this other back end stuff, right? And then escrow is you what you pay for in advance. So an escrow is money that's held in trust for you, right? So property taxes are paid part of your mortgage. Insurance is paid as part of your mortgage. Mortgage insurance is paid as part of your mortgage. All this stuff gets paid monthly up front. Escrow account disperses when necessary. That's what an escrow account is. No HOA is in your escrow. CDD is though. CDD is in your escrow? Mm -hmm. It's in your tax bill. So it's in your escrow. Mm -hmm. You're only required to escrow if you have less than 20% down. After that you can not So escrow. CDDs are part of your tax bill? Mm -hmm. So if you don't pay uh, your CDD fees, you're pretty they much... Can, it goes to the first lien on your property. Man, I'm glad we don't buy any barking. I don't like CDD either. communities. I don't do CDDs. And CDDs never go away. Contrary to popular belief that CDDs go away, CDDs do. do not go away. The bond portion of the CDD goes away. There's two portions of a CDD. There's operations and maintenance, and then there's the bond. The bond goes away after 30 years. The O&M stays, and you continue to pay the fees on that. So it's, never, operations oh, it's never no, really goes away. That's terrible. Because they can raise the O and M. So then, <laughs> so it, the theory is, is it goes away after thirty years, but it doesn't. Part of it goes away. Maybe percentage. Right. So mortgage, mortgage payments are always calculated as PITI, right? PITI, principal, principal interest, tax, insurance. Now, we add the A in there for qualification purposes. So it's PITI A. A is association, homeowner association. Mm -hmm. yeah. But PITI is principal interest, monthly taxes, and insurance. That's what PITI stands for. So if you ever ask me what the payment is, PITI. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Right? Discount points are going to get do some lovely calculations. But all you need to know about discount points, it says added loan fee. It's upfront interest. You pay points to get your interest rate lower. Right. So if your interest rate seven and a half, you pay two points. I'm sorry. Interest rate seven and a half, you pay four points, four percent of the loan. You pay down, you, you get do a rate of seven percent. Break even point. And there's break that. evens and all that. Other so stuff. yeah, I used to do the break even calculations. Loan origination fee is the charge, like Andrew does, to to get paid on this loan. Now most places don't do loan origination fees anymore. They do some type of underwriting and processing fee, and then they also have. Um, a spread that they make money on. So they get a wholesale rate, they sell you a retail rate, and that's how they make their money, so they don't have this quote origination fee, right? On a mortgage, you can make up to five points legally. So sometimes they charge 1% origination and make four points on the back end. Or sometimes they charge two points origination and make three points on the back end. Sometimes they charge no origination fee and make three points on the back end. They don't necessarily have to charge you 5%, but they do, right? A lot of places make two and a half to three percent on the loan. That's what they make. Here's loan to value calculation. Purchase price is 200,000, loan is 180,000. You take their 180, you divide it by 200, you get 90. We're gonna do some of these questions, so I'm not gonna work it out right now on the board. Just wanna get through the material, then we'll do the questions. Here's how you calculate that homeless, and this is how you'll see it on the exam, right? So homeless purchase with a down payment of $80,000. The borrower is approved for a mortgage on a 320. What is the loan to value? You take the 320, you subtract the 80,000. Well, in this case, they're doing it different. Added. Right? Down payment. So the mortgage loan, oh, I'm sorry, it's approved for mortgage. Yeah, it doesn't, this isn't a clearest question. So, take so in this case, they've added the 80,000 to get a $400,000 sale. It'd be 20% down, 80% LTV. Mm -hmm. But in the real world, I would put 20, I would put the 80,000 down and then that, that would be my leftover or my 
my purchase price, then I would have 25% down. My 80,000 divided by 320 is one over four, which is 25%. Does that make sense? So this is a four hundred thousand dollars. This is a four hundred thousand dollars. They're right. trying. This is at. This is saying what is the LTV? Well, they're saying you have to determine the sales price first. Okay. So the sales price would be. This isn't 000. clear. This isn't clear. It says the borrower was approved for a mortgage loan of three twenty. It should it say the borrower 8, took out a mortgage for three hundred twenty thousand. Mm -hmm. the, the, the way the wording is wrong. So. The way this reads is wrong. So it should say a home was purchased with a down payment of eighty thousand dollars. The amount of the mortgage is three hundred and twenty. Not they were approved for a three hundred twenty thousand dollar mortgage. The amount of the mortgage was three twenty. What is the LTV? Then you would add the three twenty to the eighty to get the four hundred thousand. That's your actual sales price. Okay. Calculate the LTV. Three twenty divided by four hundred, and you get eighty percent. Bam, loan value. But this this question, the way it's worded, is incorrect. So it kind of threw me off yeah, there. Yeah, it is confusing, right? Because it says approved. We'll do a real question so that you can actually figure it out, right? Discount point calculations, cost of borrower. So we're, this is this is probably one of the most confusing things in the mortgage world. Discount points are based on an eight point system. Discount points are really upfront entrance okay so discount points you're going to have a scale of one to eight points oops you're never going to have an eight point origination fee you're never going to have an eight point fee for any buy downs okay when they talk about the whole thing they say rate buy downs rate buy down you heard that term rate buy down yeah that's how you can do that with, with discount points Right, rate buy down, right? You can buy down with this discount, discount point. So one discount point, one discount point equals one percent of the loan amount. That's true. And cost. One percent of loan amount in cost equals one eighth of percent one eight percent sorry one eighth percent interest rate discount point one discount point equals one percent of loan amount for the cost so if you have a four hundred thousand dollar loan, it's four thousand dollars. But if your interest rate was six percent, your interest rate went down to five point eight seven five. It's only a one. It's only a deduction. So I you remember that. So it's point one two five here, right? Point two five, point three seven five, point five, point six two five, point seven five, point eight seven five, mm -hmm. and then one percent. It's, this is one of the most confusing things because you're like, well, how much is the discount point? Well, you have to know, or are you talking about interest rate or are you talking about the cost of the loan? All right, so on a $400,000 loan, this is 4,000. Two points is 8,000. Will this be on the test, Jimmy? Yes, 12,000, 16,000, all the way to 32,000. Ah, I just want to show you, 32,000. So we have to know what we're talking about. Are we talking about dollars or are we talking about the interest rate? So if you say I want to have a $400,000 loan and I want to buy down the rate by a half a percent, how much is it going to cost me? It's going to cost me four points because that's a half a percent. But it's going to cost me 4% of the loan to do that. So it's going to cost me 16. We're going to work an example because it gets confusing. Mm -hmm. Remember, one point equals 1% of the loan amount, but it equals one, one, one eighth of a percent of interest rate. We had a calculator. Right. It's just a so the question here is, a couple purchased their home for 425,000. The buyer finance with an 80% LTV. 
The lender charged three points. How much was the cost of the total points? So we can work this one on the board. You can see it on the screen here, but basically we have a couple things. So this is how it's going to be worded. So you got to make sure you do this right. The house cost price was four hundred and twenty-five thousand, right? The LTV, which we know is loan to value, is eighty percent, right? The lender charged three points. How much was that? How much was that? So you take the 425 times the 80% LTV. What do you get? Loan amount. We have to know what the loan amount was and we have to know before we can figure out the points. So loan amount would be 80% of 425 is 340,000. If you do the math, you'll see that's what it is. 340,000 times 0 0.03 equals $10,200 in points. That's what you're going to have to figure out for the state exam. It's going to be even more difficult sometimes on the state exam where they'll say the interest rate was 6%, but they wanted it to be 5 and a quarter. How many points and how much? So this is cost? the this is the formula for it. The three. Don't three. learn the formula. Learn the concept because this formula is not going to necessarily be the case. Right. I mean, I, I would know the concept. Know how to manipulate the number. Because the loan amount is three forty. Okay. Times. Because the question might say the house they bought the house for four twenty five, and the down payment was forty five thousand dollars. How much were the points? It's the same question, but they're not telling you the LTV, they're telling you the down payment. So then you still have to know what the loan amount is to calculate the points. You have to know loan, the loan amount. You have to know the loan amount to calculate the points because points are based on what? A percentage of the loan amount. We just talked about that. Right. Interest rate is different. We'll explain it. I'll do questions on that. Here's the question on discount points. You got this? No. Huh? No, one sec. We're gonna do calculations on this so you don't okay. so you're more comfortable with it. So we need to know the LTV? We have to figure out the LTV sometimes. LTV. Sometimes you're given the LTV, sometimes you have to figure out the LTV. So do we need it for this here? With loan to value calculations a star. You have to have the loan amount, so you have to know the LTV. Mm -hmm. You have to know two things. You have to know the purchase price and the down payment, or you have to know the purchase price and the loan value. You have to. If you don't know one of those two things, you can't figure out the other. Right, for sure. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll explain. We'll do the calculations separately on another level. So back to rate buy downs, we have discount point calculations, right? We just talked about discount point. Discount point, as far as rates concerned, is one eighth of one percent for one point. Okay. This is known as the lender's yield, or your. I don't like how it's written on here. It says or annual percentage rate. No, that's not true. Annual percentage rate takes in consideration not only your yield spread, and not only your interest rate, but also takes into account your closing costs. So this is not a true textbook answer, but the textbook says known as lender's yield, return, or APR. Just know in real life that's not the case. Um, each discount point will increase the yield by one eighth of a percent. Okay. One eighth of a percent is basically taking one divided by eight. Mm -hmm. One eighth of a percent is a fraction. It's easy, mm -hmm. it's one eighth. In the real world, we don't do discount points on the eighth. We do it on every little fraction of a hundred. Okay, it's different. I can show you a rate sheet and you'll see what I'm talking about. Example, a lender charges two points on a $120,000 loan at 4% interest. What is the effective yield? Well, we know two points is two over eight, which is one over four. 
1 over 4 is 0.25. So we would add the 0.25 to the 4% to get the effective yield. Mm -hmm. Right, because we would have paid two points. So would be How much would those two points cost? Mm -hmm. Loan amounts 120, multiply it by 2%, and we get a cost of $2,400 not written on there, but the question can be asked either way. So we need to know. Does that make sense? It's kind of confusing. He's got a few steps that we just got to remember. We're going to work questions. So let's just walk through this and then mm -hmm. we'll, we'll answer questions. So we just said the effective rate yield, right? The effective rate is what you're actually getting, actually getting charged, right? Effective yield. Lender charges three points on a thirty thousand, or sorry, a thirty-year, two hundred thousand dollar loan. It doesn't matter if it's thirty years. You, when they give you that, they're just trying to confuse you. Lender charges three points on a two hundred thousand dollar loan at four percent interest. What is the effective yield? We're not taking closing costs and all that other stuff into consideration. Remember, this is textbook stuff, right? Close, cost of the points is two hundred thousand times how many point? How many percent? Well, if it's three points, we know that's three percent of loan amount, right? Times 0 0.03 is six thousand dollars. So far, we're good. Mm -hmm. The lender receives six thousand dollars of prepaid interest because discount points is really just prepaid interest, right? The lender has only used one hundred ninety-four thousand of their own money. This is just another way of thinking about it. Three discount points times 0 0.125 because each discount point is one eighth of a percent, right? equals 0.375 increased yield. So you have your stated interest rate of 4%, you add the 3 eighths to it, 0.375, and you get the effective rate of 4.375. Because four Confusing. points are paid up front, I right. think. It's going to be this way, but it's also going to be written as, if the rate is 6.5 and we want it to be 6 and an eighth, how many points do I have to use? Right? And we have to calculate it that way. you got to bring it down. Assignment of mortgage. You know what an assignment of mortgage is? Uh, where you assign it over to someone else? It's right here. Oh, assignment is when ownership of a mortgage is transferred one company to an individual. Right? Oh, that's assignment of mortgage is when we're assigning it to somebody else. Another Got owner. It. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's assignment when you're buying or selling, or it's assignment of a mortgage when I sell my mortgage to another lender. Right? Assignment is assignment. You're just doing something. Okay. What do you call when you, you overtake the mortgage for someone? Just, it's uh, it's got a name, right? I thought yeah, I have to think about it again. It's uh, a mortgage assumption. Assumption of mortgage. That's assumption that. of mortgage. Okay. Go We're ahead. gonna talk about assumptions. Assignment. Whether assignment. it's assigning something, it doesn't matter. Assignment. If you're assigning a contract, you're assigning a mortgage, you're selling that for something else for a profit, you're okay. making money off of it. Right? Makes sense. That it, it's accessories or assigns. We just talked about that. The same thing. So if they sell a mortgage, they've got the they've got the mortgage clause are covered by the insurance. Right. Oh, okay. Estoppel, it's funny we just brought that up Stop. earlier with Paul, right? Estoppel certificate is a stop claim. The word stop is in estoppel. Mm -hmm. Remember that. The word stop is in estoppel. Basically what an estoppel does, the mo when you see these are with the HOA, right? It, it's other, there's other things too, but estoppels are mostly seen with HOAs, homeowners associations. It's a stop the claim on you and transfer it to somebody else, right? Anything from the day of closing back is your responsibility. If you had a fine, you didn't have a, a pay due or whatever, you pay that, the estoppel then moves it to the new owner, you're done. Estoppel is a stop claim to that amount owed is different than the actual unpaid balance or that the interest rate is other than the contracted rate. Estoppel stops the claim against you. So if now there's anything asked. owed prior, you pay for it. If there's anything owed after, they pay. No, when you say me, would I be the buyer? Seller? If you sell your house and your HOA dues are four hundred dollars right. a year, or four hundred dollars, a hundred dollars a quarter, okay, right. and we're closing June thirtieth, right. you're responsible for two hundred dollars of that. Got it. The new owner's responsible for two hundred dollars. So, right. They stop. They they issue this estoppel certificate for the day of closing. In this case, June thirtieth, and now you're only responsible for that 200. If you've already paid it, then you're good. If you haven't paid it, they're gonna come after you to pay for it on your closing statement, and they're gonna give the new bills to the new people. It's a stop claim against you. Just remember, if you see the word estoppel, it's a stop claim. How, how would the uh, question be in the test? That's just like that, what is an estoppel? Estoppel is a stop claim. 
the stop thing. Okay, easy. All right, verifies the amount of the unpaid balance, the interest rate, the date that it's been prior to the assignment. See what I'm saying? There's an estoppel, right? When you do an assignment, there's an estoppel. When you do an HOA, when you do anything, you're changing over something, and there's HOA dues, there's an estoppel. It also shows shows violations, anything else that you might be doing, that you might have to pay. Purchasing a property encumbered by an existing mortgage, right? Here's the assumption. You just brought it up. The buyer executes a new promissory note and becomes primarily liable for the debt on the assumption. So you still have to qualify for the assumption, right? The seller is still liable for the original promissory note, but the original promissory note gets paid off at closing, so you get the money back, mm -hmm. right? Novation agreement makes the buyer solely responsible in the event of a default. Novation is removing the liability. This process of novation is removing the liability from the seller and placing it on the buyer. Novation. Novation, if you see in sign an assumption of mortgage, know that novation might be one of the answers. Okay. Novation. Don't get too hung up on what a novation is, but that's what it does. Due on sale clause, what is that? We just talked about it. If you sell it, you have to pay the mortgage off in full, right? Or the, the note off in full, not the mortgage. See, everybody says mortgage. Yeah. Note yeah. off in full, right? Mm -hmm. If it's subject to a mortgage, the buyer is not personally liable for that repayment of debt because they're assuming it and, and signing a new note, right? The seller's responsible for the old note. The buyer takes title and the seller is legally responsible for that note, right? The buyer takes title Seller is legally responsible for the original note. But remember, they just got a new note, and the old note's being paid off. So that's why you have to, that's how this whole assumption thing works. Make sense? For sure. It's confusing. But it's an assumption uh, the individual's Don't to get qualify. too hung up on all this. The individual on an assumption still has to qualify for a mortgage. They still have to get a new note. So they have to apply? Correct. Right. Through the assumption. Correct. Plus the process in order to get the mortgage. Correct. Correct. Yeah. You can't just assume somebody's mortgage. Right. And not be able to, and not be able to that. qualify. You have right. to you have to assume the mortgage with the ability to repay. The, the problem is because a buyer has to be ready, willing, and able. Right. right. The key being they're able, right? Ready and willing is one thing, but you have to be able. Ready, willing, and able. We have this thing called contract for deed, land contract. You're never gonna hear this term again. Use the finance to sale and the borrower doesn't have enough down payment. Seller financing, this is also called seller financing. This okay. is something I would like to get into. Right. Buyer makes a small down payment, buyer makes monthly payments to the seller, the seller retains the legal title until the debt's repaid, right? Buyer gets possession at closing, buyer gets possession at closing has this thing called equitable title, remember? Because if you have the deep sea rights, right? Then you have equitable title. The seller's a vendor and the buyer's a vendor. Okay. Contract for D is seller financing. Mm -hmm. Just remember that, seller financing. I have a contract with you personally. I'm going to buy the deed from you. You're going to give me the deed after I pay off. What about if there's some mortgage? Debts. There yeah, wouldn't be a mortgage. It's there, different. Okay, got it. Mortgage is different. Mortgage, then it falls under lien theory. Under right lien theory. Florida. Got it. So that's. Okay. Mortgage is a lien. You get full title. I put a lien on your title. On it? Right. You get full title, even if there's a mortgage note, it doesn't matter, a promissory note. So what do you think? Then, then they have to foreclose on it. You used to finance the sale of property you want to buy it, does not have sufficient cash to right. make a down payment. Like Seller financing. Secure additional financing. Seller financing. Because mm -hmm. if somebody's going Contract to Contract for need is seller financing. Seller financing. Then we have this thing called land development loans and, or construction loans. We call them construction to permanent loans. This land development funds like the street used, right? Mm -hmm. Construction loan, the lender disperses funds, draws construction as construction process. So when we talk about draws, we're talking about pulls of money out, right? So maybe I needed $10,000 to clear the land. And I need another $10,000 to, to put down the foundation. I need another $10,000 to put in the plumbing. I need another $10,000 to, to put the frame up, right? Those $10,000 are draws. They're taking draws on this, right? And it's short-term financing during the construction. Well, normally what happens is as soon as you take the draws out, then you have to pay interest-only payments on these draws. This is like a withdrawal. I remember this. Right. It's basically like an open line of credit you're doing draws And this on. is for new construction. 
This is a construction of permanent loan is what this is talking about. They don't call it that, but that's what the real term is. They call it land development and construction loans. They're construction of permanent because at the end of the process, it's all packaged up into like one, almost like a refi, and then you're actually paying off a real mortgage, right? Blanket mortgages are different. Blanket mortgages are, let's say I want to develop 30 lots of land. I'm going to give you a blanket mortgage, seller financing, contract for deed on this 30 lots of land. I'm going to do partial release clauses. It says right here, partial release clause. Every time you sell one house, we'll release five more to you. Remember how builders always say, well, I'm going to, where they're going to release like five lots? It's because yeah. they're in a blanket situation, right? So Got they're it. going to release five lots. That's why right? they do it that way. Well, that's because they want to sell it that way, but it's the same theory, right? Partial release clause then releases these lots. I can build on these lots. When I sell two more of these, I can release five more. When I sell two more of these, I can release five more. And then eventually everything gets released, right? The takeout commitment then becomes permanent financing because now I've bought all these houses, I've sold these houses, they're all become permanent financing, right? And the buy down, a buy down, I don't know why it's on this page, but basically you can buy down an interest rate. So two, one buy down, maybe it costs you two points to buy down the rate for a year. So this shouldn't be on this page for some reason. That should be it's, out of, it's out of whack. But here's the thing. Why would somebody do a 2-1 buy-down? What is a 2-1 buy-down? Here's what a 2-1 buy-down is. In today's world, interest rates are about 7%. So today's rate is 7% today, right? Well, I can't afford 7%. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay four points. I'm just going to say it's a five hundred thousand dollar loan because that way we can kind of monetize it and we kind of see that's the loan amount. Right? This is a loan amount. LA is loan amount. Okay. Seven percent today. Maybe my payment is thirty five hundred dollars, and I'm just using round numbers. But let's say my payment is thirty five hundred dollars, and I make I make six thousand dollars a month. Mortgage payment. Which is actually on the note. Remember, we call it a mortgage payment, but it's actually the paying back the note, right? So 3,500 35, divided by 6,000 is greater than 50%, right? It's more than half, right? So this is greater than 50%, right? Yeah. So I don't know what the actual number is, but it's like 58%, right? 50%. Yeah, I think it's 58.3%. Okay. So do the math. And what is it again? I'm sorry. 3,500 divided by 6, 235 divided by 6,000 or 600. Damn, 58.3%, 58. 58. right? Why in the world didn't you know that? <laughs> so, because 5 divided by 6 is 83. Okay, okay so. <laughs> do the math. So, so we're greater than 50%, right? So we can't qualify for this mortgage assuming normal underwriting standpoint, we get 50%, right? It's not 50%, but let's say it's 50%, right? Well, at 5%, 6%, my mortgage would be 3,000, okay? At 5%, and I'm just making up numbers, this would be 2,500, right? Let's just say my payment at 5% would be 2,500, right? Well, my monthly income is 6,000. So what is this number when we talk about percentages? 2,500 divided by 6,000 is 50% minus, so it's 41.67. Uh, yes. 41.66. Okay, well, 66. Yeah, 66 right. So I did it faster than you put in your calculator. So 2,500 divided by 6,000 is 41.67. It's less than 50%, right? This is 50%, less than 6,000, right? Or less than 50%. So this person qualifies at 5%, right? So we're buying the rate down for one year at 5%, for two years at 6%, for three years at 7%, right? So we want you to have a lower payment so we're doing 2% buy down, right, for, for year one. 
1% buy down for year two, 0% buy down for year three. I'm not going to tell you how much it costs because it's going to confuse you on the points thing, right? But in theory, let's say it was 2% buy down. Well, 2% buy down, one eighth of percent is one point, right? So in theory, this will be 16 points. Well, we know that's not true because that's over the life of the loan. So it's going to be a lower amount here. So I'm not going to give you those dollar amounts. The theory behind this whole thing says that in two years, I'm going to get a pay raise and make more money. Right. So then I'll have more flexibility. Because most people don't stick stagnant in their jobs. Most people in a year or two, they're going to get promoted or they're going to find another place to work. Right? That's the whole theory behind this, this buy down thing that we're talking about on this next page. Right? So it's not, it's not per se a refund? Don't get too hung up on this. Don't get too hung up on this. Just know what a buy down is. Okay. This is what a buy down is. This is a very gross example. It's not really how it works in real life. Which page do you have? Okay. Just know what a buy down is. Focus more about rates and well, discount points. There's going to be a question about discount points. I've seen it on every state exam. Okay, discount points, that one. Mm -hmm. So what do we do when the buyer doesn't pay? You don't pay, you don't stay, right? You don't pay, you don't stay. Remedies for the buyer or the borrower defaulting. What happens is the bank will sue you. They're going to initiate this lawsuit. They're going to say, you haven't paid. I'm going to sue on the note, and I'm going to obtain this judgment for foreclosure. They're going to execute the judgment against any real or personal property except for homestead. Well, now, on your homestead, it's a little different, right, because we can't push you out of your house. Well, actually you can because you signed a note or you signed a mortgage and a note saying that if I don't pay, then you can have my property, right? So the second remedy is initiate foreclosure proceeding, right? Foreclose on a project property subject to a lien. Accelerate, use that acceleration clause, right? Make it all due in full because you haven't paid your payment and then sell your house at public option. Remember, we told you, you can redeem, right? right. So if you have $10,000 in court fees and legal fees, and you have a $190,000 mortgage, if you show up today of auction with a $200,000 note from somebody else, you can redeem yourself on that property and take the keys back, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes when there's a foreclosure going on, they'll give you cash for keys. Listen, we'll move, you get out, we'll give you $3,000, get out of the house, Give us a title, sign it over to us, and we'll part ways, mm -hmm. right? You've heard of cash for keys, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Okay. It's kind of how it works, right? If you haven't, if you don't know what cash for keys is, look up this movie called 99 Homes and watch it. It's about a guy that lost his house and I'm doing cash for keys on 99 Homes to get his house back. Kind of interesting. That's cool. It's really cool about the whole wholesale industry. Is it on Netflix? It used yeah, to be on yeah. Netflix. You should, yeah, you told me about it. I watched it right? before. 99 what? 99 homes. So equity or redemption. Equity or redemption is what I just talked about, right? Mortgagor, mortgagor is the borrower, right? Can prevent the foreclosure by paying a principal and interest due plus collection expenses, right? So I just paid my court costs, my legal fees, my interest in principal for that time period, and I get my house back. Right of redemption ends once the property is sold at auction, sold at foreclosure sale. You can literally redeem your property. Somebody else can be under contract and you still have the right to redeem your property. As long as it's not sold. Because you still own the... Because you still own it. Right. You're still the title holder. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, you've got first steps. The doctrine of caveat emptor applies, right? Let the buyer beware. Public purchase is subject to any prior liens of record or interest when there's constructive notice, right? So what that means is... What if a municipal lien got added to the property for somebody that fell over or something like that? I sold one like this not too long ago on a short sale. It wasn't a foreclosure, so there wasn't equity or redemption, but there was a lien where somebody had fallen on the property. It was like a $5,000 lien on the property. So we ended up getting the buyer to pay for it because the house was still worth it. Mm -hmm. Huh. Coming next, short sale. short sale. I didn't even know that was the next slide. What is a short sale? 
Does anybody know what a short sale is? Where you uh, pay less than the mortgage? Short on? sale is paying less than the mortgage. I like to use red pen for this because short sale means this. I bought a house for $200,000. This actually happened to me. I sold a house, so I bought for this, sold for this for $68,000. So let's use the real numbers. I bought the house for $197,000. I sold the house for $68,000. Now I made payments in between, right? I made payments on it for four or five years and the market crashed and the house wasn't really worth anything. So we sold it for $68,000. This was back in the mortgage crisis, right? Well, what happens to the $129,000 that's still owed, right? What happens to that? Well, we just talked about the bank can sue you for a deficiency, right? So they get a deficiency judgment, they put it on your credit, blah, 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 blah. Well, they did that to me in a foreclosure. I had a $92,000 judgment on my credit. But my house foreclosed during the Obama thing where they, they forgave it. Yeah. They forgave it. So somebody tried to put bad debt on my record, wow. right? Well, anyway, that stuff followed me around for years, you gotta and I got to clear it up. I didn't have to pay it back. Thank but goodness. in this case, what I've done is I've called the bank. I can't make the mortgage, right? Will you take this? Will you take? Will you take this price? Will you approve this price? They call it bank approved price, right? Did the bank approved price for this? Well, if the bank approves this price, that means they're not going to charge you this. You're going to get relieved of that loss because you're going to sign the title over willingly mm -hmm. right you're going to sign everything over to them willingly you're still going to have foreclosure right. i mean you're not going to have foreclosure on short sale but you would have a foreclosure if you didn't do it right mm -hmm. so either you do or you don't right this isn't a deed in lieu of foreclosure you're not giving a deed in lieu of foreclosure you're bank? actually getting the bank to approve the lower price that's, that's kind of rare this, this is this day today it's rare right but maybe, back then it was very right. common maybe next year quarter four we'll talk i just did a short sale um a year and a half ago where they owed one hundred and twenty thousand, and we sold it for 81. Mm -hmm. wow so it could have a nice discount so that again the house now is worth 225 but it also had fifty thousand dollars in damage mm -hmm. so there's, there's still bank. equity to be had there was equity but the bank sees once it's fixed. But the bank saw that because I went in, took pictures, right. pr provided it to the negotiator, mm -hmm. and they approved the short sale. That's good. Right. So you have to know how to get it done. Mm -hmm. I love short sales because I get paid more money on. Okay. You get paid five to six percent to do the short sale. Because the bank's paying more. It depends on who the investor is. If Fannie Mae's the investor, you pay six percent. And who pays the commission? Uh, the bank. The bank. Well, it comes out of the proceeds. Nice. So I like short sales. Most real estate agents are scared of short sales. I've got a process that we can close a short sale in 30 days. So short sale team. I know how to do them and get them done. And most people take forever. Thank My you. longest short sale <laughs> was in like 2009. It took four years. Mm -hmm. Jimmy, so does a short sale affect your credit? A hundred percent. That's what I thought. It's not as bad as a foreclosure. It's still need because it's a, it's it's like. It's like a credit card, right? You have a charge off and then you have a settlement. Well, right? it it's you're more like a settlement, not a charge off. Because so you're behind your payments pretty much. You're, you're always behind your payments. Right. Yeah. And they then, won't approve a short sale if you're not behind on your payments. Yeah. And then what can you come back from that financially? Yeah, I did. Do you have, do I had a short sale and a foreclosure. Six, Just had to wait time. It, uh, short sales, it depends. It's like four years. It depends on the type of loan. If it's VA, it's less. And foreclosure? Foreclosure could be seven. That's what I thought we were going to have to do with mine, but then the housing market just... We work, it worked out here for her. She got yeah, lucky because yeah, she owed quite a bit. She ended up making money on her house. Nice. Good job. Yeah. We were like negative $29,000. We're like, nope, nope, we're going to make you some money on this. Nice. Yeah. You still had a good time. Yeah. Yeah. So then the opposite, or part of the thing is this deed in lieu of foreclosure. And I already mentioned that on the previous slide. But basically in depressed market assistance, remember the market's gone down. Mm -hmm. You're going to see some of this happening right now because the market's gone down about 10%, 15%. And depressed market conditions, a lender may agree to a negotiated sale rather than a foreclosure auction, which was the short sale, right? Mm -hmm. Or this, right? 
deed in lieu of foreclosure is still a foreclosure. It's a, it's a, it's a friendly foreclosure. We're not suing you, but you're basically giving the property it's back, right? It's still a foreclosure. Mm -hmm. It defaults it on it, right? They don't call it a foreclosure because they haven't actually sued you for it. They call it a deed in lieu. Deed in lieu. So oh. I'm going to tell you, in 2008, I had a foreclosure. Back in the mortgage crisis, I had a foreclosure because I didn't pay, mm -hmm. right? I didn't pay because it was worth less than the property. A lot of people did that, Yeah, right? I did that. Doesn't make you a bad person. You just know I'm not paying back $200,000 for something that's worth 50. I'm not 50. paying for a bad investment. Right. Right. I'm not doing it. I'm going to lose money. I'm going to ruin my credit, but I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to lose all this money because I can't afford to lose all this money because I'll be on the street, right? Right. So you do what you have to do to protect yourself. Defaulting, trans defaulting borrower transfer title. So I went to court and I said to the, to the lender, I was like, the lender's attorney, and I said, listen, I was like, I'll just sign the deed over you. This deed in lieu of foreclosure. Mm -hmm. So you did this? If you have other liens on your property, if you have other liens on your property, a lot of times they'll say, okay, we'll do the deed in lieu of foreclosure because we don't want to deal with your other liens, your judgments, whatever else might be on your property. In this case, I had no other liens because I always had good credit, mm -hmm. right? I had no other liens. So the attorney said, no, we're not going to do a deed in lieu of foreclosure. We're just going to foreclose because it's cleaner. So they ruined my credit for a longer period of time. Deed in lieu, you're going to get it relieved faster than a foreclosure because it's a friendly foreclosure. You didn't fight for the property, mm -hmm. right? So when he told me that, I just drug it out as long as I could because if they're going to hurt me, I'm, gonna, right. I'm not going to let them Well, with this one pretty much is you let it go, like right, right. away. See, the lender takes the title subject to the existing liens. Mm -hmm. Remember what I said. He said, well, you don't have any other liens, so we're going to do this deed in lieu. I mean, we're going to do a foreclosure. Mm -hmm. If I had other liens, he would have said, no problem, we'll do the deed. Mm -hmm. See, so he said, this one's clean, so we don't care. We'll just foreclose. That's what's up. Foreclosure on in in income property. <laughs> so actually, this was my case. So I don't know if you know this, but if you're renting a property out and you let it foreclose, the mortgagee has the right to take the rent money, right? Receivership clause means if I'm charging you $1,000 in rent and I let the property go into default and foreclose, you can collect $1,000 in rent. Who right? the... the lender can, right? Allows the receiver to be appointed to collect the income from the property and use the income to make the mortgage payment in the event of a default. That makes sense. So what did I do when I wanted this property foreclosed? I called the tenant and said, I don't want any more payments from you. Good luck. Have a nice day. You can stay until they well, get it. What would happen if you were to receive payments after? They could have tried to get it from me. Hmm. Now, a lot of people just collect it and nobody ever finds out. Hmm. But in my case, I was like, I just don't want to deal with it. I'm going to wash my hands of it. I collect it. Bye. Have a good day. Live there for six months. As long as it takes them to kick you out. Okay. Have a nice day. Right? Yes. That's, that's kind of how it works, right? A good person's not going to do that to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Look, I know you're going to have to move. Save up that little bit of money for rent so you can go somewhere else. And then I'll go on my way. We'll shake hands and have a good day. That's how that works. So this whole term list pendants, I've talked to you about this already. But when they're going to foreclose, they have to give you notice. They have to serve you notice, right? So they send this notice out called a list pendants, right? So anytime somebody gets a notice of list pendants, they started this foreclosure process, or they call it free pre-foreclosure. Mm -hmm. Notice notice recorded in public records of pending legal action involving real estate. So anytime it's involving real estate, it's a list pendants, right? It's again constructive notice. We've seen constructive notice like four or five mm -hmm. times, right? Constructive notice means what? I've recorded that document, right? Names of parties object to the action and the legal description. It will have your name on it but it gets delivered to everybody involved. If you have a tenant, if you have a co-signer, anybody that's involved will get a copy of this list pendants. So your tenants will know that there's a notice of list pendants. Mm -hmm. What's gonna happen when you get a notice of list pendants and you have a tenant? They're gonna say, well, I'm not gonna pay you. You're not paying a mortgage. Right, where's right. our money going? <laughs> so I had somebody actually buy a house one time and rent it to somebody and was taking the mortgage payments and paying off their credit cards. 
<laughs> so it became a foreclosure situation. So we got one of these lists pendants, and I was, that's how I found out about it because I was helping, but I wasn't doing anything but just helping with the tenant collection, right? Mm -hmm. well, they were getting the money and then they weren't paying off the mortgage. They, they were spending it mm -hmm. on credit Spending cards. it on credit cards. Mis mismanagement of money led to a list pendants, led to the tenant having to be located somewhere else, move, and, look, and the owner to lose their credit. So mm -hmm. list pendants, can be fixed if you catch everything up, right? Is it three months? Eh, three, four months on average. Um, a lot of times it's longer. I mean, like I said, it took four years on one for the short pendants. sales. Wow. I've seen list pendants issued a year before auction, or, you know, foreclosure. Mm -hmm. Great properties you can sell. But it's normally, uh, if they miss three payments, 